just 50 new infections today and fewer yesterday. Rita, look, I'm sorry to keep harping on this, but I, what is it going to take to make people start thinking, hey, maybe it is time we can be let out of our homes? Well, we've flattened the curve, but that doesn't seem to be enough now. It seems to be we have to wait for a vaccination or we have to have zero new cases. Uh, I thought the whole effort that we were launching here was not only to flatten the curve, make sure that we protect our hospitals and do not overwhelm them like we saw in Italy and parts of Spain where there were literally more people needing hospital beds and respirators than that they were available. So obviously the drastic actions we took were to avoid that happening in Australia. That's not going to happen in Australia. That's evident now. And yet we've set new goalposts and uh, I can understand why we want to minimise... They haven't set new goalposts, deaths. Rita. They've hidden them. They've actually hidden the goalposts. <laughs> I've got no idea now. The curve is flat. We've done that. The beds aren't full in the ICU units. We've done that. What's the goalposts? And they say, we won't tell you where we've put them. You have no idea. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, there needs to be far greater transparency. And we are getting now consistently mixed advice. And I think people are entitled to ask, what are you basing this advice on? Because we've got the Chief Medical Officer for Australia telling us schools should open. That is perfectly safe and acceptable for them to reopen. And yet we've got the chief health officer down here in Victoria saying, no, it, was, it would it be, uh, be at unacceptable risk for schools to operate in term two. So people are entitled to ask, how can you have two senior medical officials who are advising governments be on such, <laughs> at such odds? It's uh, just, look, honestly, yeah, but when you have a look at that reasoning, look, uh, we can't uh, risk having kids go to school because parents will mingle. Well, all you need to say is stagger the drop-off times and we'll have teachers there. You, the child exits the car, if that's how it's done, and we will take it from there. The parent does not get out. Or if they walk to school, you leave them there and you don't mingle. You turn right back straight away. The teacher will do the rest. I mean, it's just be practical, people. Be practical. What's wrong with it? And have, and have some faith in people that they will behave Correct. like adults. No Correct. one is going to be trying to put themselves or their children at risk. And if people do the wrong thing, and there will be people who do a small minority, then you can remedy that. You can have sa sanctions for them. And we've seen plenty of sanctions uh, being handed out uh, all across the country. Uh, and we've got a Sure, a policeman outside every school, you know. There are plenty enough around them chasing off beaches. Let them stand outside of school and monitor this. You're yeah, so right. Hey, but listen, you know what it seems to me too, Rita? I don't know whether you've picked this up. This issue of, you know, let's start relaxing the bands a little bit, the ones that are most useless. For one, I'd, the first one to get rid of would be on elective surgery. The ban on elective surgery is ridiculous. We've got... Doctors and nurses sitting around waiting for ICU patients uh, who have got coronavirus who aren't coming. And meanwhile, a lot of Australians who need elective surgery as, as, are sitting there at home in pain or discomfort or worry. Yes. They can't get it. The doctors are there, the beds are there, they can't get it. But it's becoming a left-right issue, all these bans. Left-right. The left seems to want more. And the right or conservatives say, well, we can afford to relax them. What's, what's going on there? And some of the characterisations of these arguments are so extreme and simplistic. It's either you want to protect people or if you even question bans or restrictions that are illogical or perhaps should be lifted at some future date, then you're advocating for the mass slaughter of the elderly. <laughs> it is just so over the top. There is no nuance at all. And you're right, the elective surgery issue is a real one. You've got people who are suffering needlessly where there's empty hospital beds, there's plenty of medical professionals who could attend to them and things like day surgery, surgeries that you know will only be a one or two night stay maximum, they're not occurring. And things like IVF, for example, all of that has been cancelled. So you've got people oh. who it may be their last chance to have a child and they can't go ahead with those procedures because 
there is a ban on elective surgery. And if you're going to have something like an egg collection or the processes that IVF go through, you can't do it. And we've got to, again, look at that cost. All of the costs that we seem to be looking at is number of infections and number of deaths that are important. But what about the other costs, which are also Correct. significant? Correct. Daniel Wilde has uh, joined us. Daniel Wilde from the IPA. Look, yeah, I was just saying to Rita, it's becoming a left-right issue whether to lift the ban, some of the bans, some of the bans, the most extreme ones, or not. And I think there was a test of it this week when uh, Gideon Hay, uh, Gideon Hay, Gideon Rosner of the IPA, your IPA, uh, did a video, it went on the ABC, said, look, maybe we should start relaxing the bans. The reaction there, what did that tell you about this left-right divide? Well, that's right, Andrew, and the, the ABC have been uh, the cheerleaders uh, when it comes to arguing for shutdown. Uh, they've apparently had very little concern for jobs, for social interaction, for people's livelihoods. Now, all as Gideon suggested and all as we've been saying at the IPA for a couple of weeks now is we need to begin the process of winding back uh, some of these shutdown measures. We know that some 70,000 Australians have lost their job every single day of this shutdown, and my concern is that we're heading towards a humanitarian crisis of biblical proportions that could far exceed the direct health consequences um, of the coronavirus. It's not just the jobs, Andrew. It's not being able to see your grandparents, not being able to see the family or friends, not being able to go to your community events or sporting events. Uh, people can deal with this for some weeks, maybe even a couple of months, but six months is not possible. And one of the concerning elements, Andrew, is there's not a lot of hope um, out there. People are losing hope. Uh, people are losing their optimism about the future. And that's why it's so important that we start to wind back these uh, social isolation measures where reasonable, where safe to do so, uh, but we must start doing it now. Look, I have to say, I am prepared to take the risk of having my son come to me at home and me give him a hug. And uh, people say, oh, look, but if you get infected, you'll infect uh, all these other people. I practice social distancing on everyone else. I don't touch anyone else. I'm very careful. Look at my little sanitizer here and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that is my risk, my risk. And I resent the government saying that I can't take it. Now, um, shopkeepers, uh, Rita, are now seeing people who went mad in the panic buying now asking for refunds. Here is John Paul Drake. He's the director of South Australia's largest family-owned supermarket chain. This is great. Have a listen. 2020, the year of Glen 20, or the year of toilet paper, the scenes that everyone has seen with the toilet paper has been absolutely ridiculous. And I had my first customer yesterday who said he wanted to get a refund on 150 packets of 32-pack toilet paper and 150 units of one-litre sanitizer. I told him that. That is the sort of person that is causing the problem in the whole country. Shame on Sky for blurring that vision. That really gets me. Now, Rita, I don't usually approve of rudeness, but... That lifted digit struck me as exactly the appropriate response. Oh, yes, and it's a bit of instant karma that these people are now saddled with all these goods that nobody wants anymore. I noticed that toilet paper at my local supermarket was actually on special, which, which we didn't see for many weeks because the, the packets were so rare. And I guess the only consolation for that hoarder is that at least those two items don't go out of date. So he's got a supply <laughs> perhaps for lifetime. But we, again, the, the mixed advice we're talking about earlier, we had the chief medical officer for... Australia come out and say hoarding is stupid, stop it. We had the Prime Minister say that. But then in Victoria, the Chief Health Officer advised people to, to have a two-week supply. And I tell you what, two Daniel, weeks supply. he actually was what? right. He was actually a bit right because I don't want to line up there for my two tins of tuna when I want ten because I like tuna. He was right. Oh, well. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's right, Andrew. And I think the response from the, the shop owner was... Uh, perhaps a bit crass, but uh, certainly valid. I, one of the most disappointing <laughs> parts of this whole, uh, this whole episode, Andrew, was the people that were hoarding. There was never going to be a supply issue. The only reason no, there was was no. because of the, the unfair, unreasonable, the inco yeah. inconsiderate yeah. actions of a few. Daniel Wild and Rita Panahi, thank you so much to you both. As our national workforce faces a crippling crisis, by tomorrow, some 80 million Americans could see what they need most, cash in their bank accounts. The Treasury Department says soon after that, a large majority of those eligible for coronavirus economic impact payments will get their money within two weeks. 
the average working family, you know, is only a couple of weeks away from not being able to pay bills. In North Carolina, hairdresser Kim Chapman says she could use the $1,200 payout for those who make less than $75,000. In Oregon, the Benton family, making less than $150,000, gets a combined $2,400 for both parents, with an additional $500 for their children under 17. It might be enough for one month to pay my rent, but it won't cover anything else or living expenses, food. My bills, definitely not. NetSpend, which processed nearly $1 billion in relief so far, says most Americans are using the stimulus money on necessities like food and gas. Facing the worst and fastest jobless crisis in modern American history, some retailers may never reopen. Lance Lawson owns a clothing boutique in Chicago, the kind of small business that accounts for 48% of American jobs. The revenue has gone from around $250,000 a month to zero. And it's been super scary. As of today, more than one million small businesses have been approved for the Paycheck Protection Program, but most have not received the cash. In hard-hit California, the writing is on the wall. Some businesses may not reopen for weeks, if not months. One crisis spurring another. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.